I welcome you to the 46th annual academic sessions of the College of Gender Practitioners of Sri Lanka. Our first resource person is Dr. Chamra Ratnayaka, consultant cardiologist. And to chair this segment, uh, I invite Dr. M.R. Hanifa and Dr. Pushpa Virasinghe. Thank you. Good morning. Dr. Chamar Ratnayak is the first speaker for the day. He is MBBS, MD, MRCP. He is the consultant cardiologist, currently working as a resident cardiologist for the artery group of hospitals in Colombo, board certified in 2017. Dr. Chamar's special interest is in interventional cardiology, especially for acute coronary syndromes. His passion is in teaching and dissemination of medical knowledge to doctors, medical students, and general public. Over to you, Dr. Shamara. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, at the outset, may I thank the uh, College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka for inviting me for this uh, uh, event. Uh, it's indeed an honor, and uh, uh, it's a privilege to be uh, on this stage. And uh, although it's an empty audience here, but I'm pretty sure there is quite a lot of uh, virtual uh, attendance, so I'm definitely privileged to be uh, standing here and talking. So I was asked to talk about uh, a very important topic, something that's close to my heart uh, as well. So it's about stable angina. So stable angina in general practice, and next step is going to be the topic which I'll be speaking about uh, over the next few minutes, and I'd like to declare that I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, so before I start the the, the main topic, I, I, I guess, as we were to say, uh, I'd like to little talk about a little story, actually, a bit of history, uh, about a gentleman called Franklin D. Roosevelt. I'm pretty sure most of you would have heard about him. He was the um, 32nd president of the United States of America. Uh, so he was uh, inducted as the U.S. president in 1933. Uh, and generally, they have their medical checkups done. And at that time, his blood pressure was noted to be 140 by 100. So current, um, in, in the current context, if somebody had a blood pressure of 140 by 100, it would have rung a few alarm bells, but not at that time. Uh, and then subsequently, about six years later, 1939, uh, the World War II started. Uh, and at that time, naturally, his blood pressure raised. It went up to 188 by 105, apparently. That's what's documented. Uh, still, uh, his physician at that time deemed that to be no more than normal for a man of his age. So at that time, what they actually thought in the 1930s and 1940s was the normal blood pressure systolic would be 100 plus the person's age. Uh, so that was technically uh, what they thought was a normal blood pressure during those times. So 188 by 105, maybe he was in 88 years, but it still was not anything, uh, again, no alarm bells rang at that time. However, a few years later, 1943, uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, developed symptoms. He got dyspnea on exertion. He got abdominal distension. He was cyanosed, and his x-ray showed an enlarged heart. Again, the blood pressure was high. It was 186 by 108. Uh, and that time, the cardiologist diagnosed him with angina, with hypertensive heart failure, prescribed him digitalis, salt restriction, phenobarbital at that time. And most importantly, he was asked to bed rest. And that was his main advice at that time. Uh, unfortunately, again, a few weeks later, his blood pressure rose up to 300 by 190 uh, and pronounced dead of a cerebral hemorrhage. So that was quite unfortunate, but this was the signs of the times. That was basically what was done at that time. Uh, however, his predecessor, his, I'm sorry, his, uh, uh, not predecessor, I'm sorry, uh, consequently after him, uh, Harry Truman took over. He was a vice president at the time, uh, and he uh, signed the National Heart Act in the, in the U.S., uh, and it established a National Heart Institute. And this also led to funding for a very, very important study called the Fram Fram Framingham Heart Study, uh, which probably m many people would have heard about right now as well. And this study actually studied the risk factors that we all know now that can develop coronary artery disease. For example, smoking, high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, etc. So this was a landmark study at the time. Uh, and pretty much uh, the unfortunate circumstances that Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, encountered led to uh, the establishment of this study. And it's very, very important from our point of view uh, 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 around 80 decades, eight decades later, rather. So it's a very important story. And that's pretty much what how we started. So as, as we talk about evolution of man, so if you talk about evolution of treatment of angina, 
So bed rest was pretty much the, uh, the chimpanzee of uh, evolution. And nowadays, in current context, uh, in cardiology as well, we have uh, the highly evolved uh, interventions in cardiology, rotablation, FFR, IOS, uh, EECP. It's a new intervention. We'll talk a little bit about it later on as well. Spinal stimulation, gene therapy. So we've, we've evolved quite a lot uh, since the bed rest that Franklin D. Roosevelt was prescribed uh, back in 1940. So I think it's important to, to know about certain things and to know a bit of history as well, I think, as far as uh, management and uh, how to uh, go about uh, patients who come to uh, our practice. So uh, the main topic here is general practice. So is it important to talk about chest pain and angina? I think so, definitely. So this was a study done in, the, in, in India uh, about presentation of patients who come to general practice, uh, over 200,000 patients. And as you can see, as far as frequency of symptoms are concerned, the commonest one I think everybody uh, who are in general practice would probably agree that it's similar to your practice as well. Uh, majority of patients will come with respiratory symptoms. Uh, the next would be digestive, but uh, third in line uh, are patients who come with circulatory problems. So that means chest pain, blood pressure, etc. So it's quite common and it's important to know how to uh, handle and to, to uh, know what to do when a patient comes to you uh, with certain symptoms of the circulatory system and our topic at hand today is angina which is obviously something which we need to talk about as well. And in patients who do come with chest pain to the general practice, again this is uh, studies in the US and Europe and I'm pretty sure it will be uh, similar to Sri Lanka as well. Uh, again, if a patient comes to you with chest pain in your practice, majority of the time it's not actually cardiac. It's probably a muscular condition, musculoskeletal. Uh, it could be, again, gastrointestinal, for example, reflux or something. But uh, about 16% of the time, or around, uh, if you were to uh, round it off, about 15% of the time, it is something serious. It's something more of a cardiac cause. Uh, and angina would account for about 10% of the patients who do come to your practice with uh, chest discomfort. So it's, again, something that you should be aware of and something you should know what to do about as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, just go through the topics, the next 40 minutes, I would say, uh, that I will be talking about today in, uh, regarding our topic at hand, which is stable angina in general practice. So, importantly, I would like to talk a, a little bit about the diagnosis. I'm not going to talk a lot about it because it's going to be boring and uh, it's um, the, the, the nitty-gritty of it. But I think it's important uh, from a general practice point of view as well to know if your patient has come with chest pain because your patient will not tell you that, doctor, I'm having angina. They'll just simply tell you that you're having, I'm having chest pain. So how do you diagnose uh, that your patient is having angina? What is the definition that we have to uh, go by? Uh, a simple uh, slide on the mechanism. I think it's important to know about the mechanism of angina if you are going to treat angina. Uh, and that's the, the physiology of it, basically. Because if you know how angina occurs, if you know what the mechanism of it is, uh, then it makes treatment uh, simpler. And the other thing which, which I will talk about in, uh, when I'm talking about the treatment as well is it's easier to explain to your patient as to why you are prescribing certain medications uh, for your for the patient's symptoms, for example. Uh, then uh, a simple uh, talk on the risk stratification and in investigations, which I will not talk in detail again, because again, that will be a bit more of a specialized topic. Uh, I will uh, talk a bit about the management principles uh, of angina and, of course, follow-up, which is again important from a general practice point of view. So how do we diagnose angina? So this is, this is a, a, a quote which I love to uh, present during my talks, and it's something very, uh, and I think a lot of people would have heard about it as well. Uh, William Osler, I'm pretty sure you would have heard about him. Uh, he has discovered many things. He was a physician in the US again. So he had a very simple saying. He said, listen to your patient. He is telling you the diagnosis. I think that pretty much uh, sums up the whole thing. So if you listen to your patient, if you take a good history from your patient, he will guide you to what the patient's having. And this doesn't necessarily have to do with angina. It's to do with anything that your patient comes to you with, uh, any symptom. If you listen closely enough, you take a good enough history, uh, you will be able to come to a conclusive diagnosis. So that's pretty much as simple as that. Listen to your patient. He will tell you what's going on. 
So as far as angina is concerned, what will your patient tell you or what would, in general, what would you have to extract from your patient? Sometimes your patient is not going to give you the typical story, isn't it? So you probably will have to ask a few uh, follow-up questions as well uh, from your patient as to whether this is angina or not. So what is typical angina? So that's what we want to know exactly if your patient is having typical angina. So typical angina will consist of three things. So it has to have all these three things. So a constricting type of discomfort in the front of the chest. So again, there's this misconception sometimes that chest discomfort is due to heart problems, heart ailments is due to in, in, in the left side of the chest. It's actually uh, a misconception. Uh, cardiac pains are more central. It's at the front of the chest. So that's something that we need to understand. And sometimes patients also think that it's, they, I have a few patients who come to me as well saying, doctor, it's unlikely that I'm having a heart pain because the pain is in the front of my chest, not on the left side. So again, it's something that we need to educate patients on as well, that uh, heart pains are actually at the front of the chest, can go into the neck, shoulders, jaws, or arms. So radiation is important. It's precipitated by physical exertion. So any type of physical exertion will make it worse and it's relieved by rest, or if they have it with them, uh, sublingual uh, GT and glycerol trinitrate, and it goes down in about five minutes' time. So that's also important that it goes down in about five minutes. It's not an immediate response to GTN. Uh, if the response to GTN is immediate, we need to again reconsider the diagnosis. Uh, it usually takes about five minutes for the uh, pain to subside. So if your patient has all three of these symptoms, that means he's definitely, or he or she rather, is having typical angina. And that definitely should ring some alarms in your, in your head as well that this needs to be dealt with. If they have two of these features, we call it atypical angina. Again, borderline, it could be angina, could be not. If they have only one or none of these symptoms, generally uh, it's so-called non-anginal chest pain. So it's probably not a typical angina. It's not cardiac chest pain in that case. So pretty much a simple definition. I think it's easy to remember. Uh, so if your patient comes up with these three symptoms, we can have uh, a definite diagnosis that angina is present. Um, so and currently, uh, so we don't use the term stable angina actually anymore. Uh, scientifically, uh, the, it's kind of a syndrome now. So we call it the chronic coronary syndromes. It's not important to remember these, but generally in, in, in scientific, scientific terminology and in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, scientific research, they use the term chronic coronary syndrome. So stable angina definitely is part of it, but again, there are other aspects of chronic coronary syndromes as well, just for us to be aware of. Uh, for example, patients sometimes present to you with heart failure, uh, not previously diagnosed as having it. So new onset heart failure, and they may be having coronary artery disease, again, part of your syndrome of chronic coronary syndromes. Patients who have stable symptoms um, after an acute coronary syndromes, uh, acute coronary syndrome rather, patients more than one year after the initial diagnosis of angina. Uh, sometimes you can get vasospastic angina. And again, with new investigation modalities such as CT scans, uh, of the heart, we do find patients who have asymptomatic coronary artery disease. So that's something that is uh, common nowadays, especially uh, we have um, more advanced technologies as far as screening is concerned. We have uh, exercise ECG, which is a bit of an archaic uh, investigation, but CT scans, again, you would have heard about it and it's done, uh, it's kind of the flavor of the uh, current uh, uh, years at the moment that uh, a lot of people have the CT scans of the heart done and we have asymptomatic patients who are diagnosed with coronary artery disease as well. So they also fall into the category of chronic coronary syndromes. Um, and another important thing, I just talk about it as well. So it's important to know, so not all patients who come with those typical angina symptoms may actually have significant coronary artery disease. It could be due to many other things as well. So angina mimics, so um, common ones, these are not the whole list, but there are some common ones we should be aware of. So aortic stenosis, it's quite, uh, uh, it's something that can definitely mimic one of the symptoms of aortic stenosis. It's indeed angina on exertion. They get chest discomfort. How do we diagnose it? So a simple method, we just listen to their heart, isn't it? We just do a simple auscultation, you'd hear the murmur. So that's a, it's as simple as that. Uh, Hokum, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, again, 
uh, again, uh, angina can be a symptom of it as well. Uh, how do we diagnose it uh, again? Family history is important, isn't it? Because they would have uh, some sort of a family history of sudden cardiac death usually or a family history of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy themselves. Again, your examination findings uh, will point towards certain clues that this pa patient may be having hokum uh, and simple investigations such, such as an ECG also would uh, help you to come up with a diagnosis of hokum. Anemia, that's very important. General practice, I think you'd agree with me that it's very common that you do get patients who have anemia and significant anemia, especially if their hemoglobin is very low, can lead to angina as well. Again, how do you know a patient has anemia? Again, examine them. You just have a simple look at their uh, uh, eyes. You can look at their tongue. You can see if they're quite pale. Uh, you probably may come up with a diagnosis that anemia is the cause of uh, their symptoms as well. And uh, low down in the list, so sometimes uh, reflux and uh, esophageal spasm could also mimic the chest pain that we, uh, the patient described, which may be similar to angina pains. Again, the history would be quite significant. So again, going back to your, uh, the slide that we spoke about earlier, uh, listen to your patient. Uh, they will tell you the diagnosis. They'll tell you uh, whether they're having angina or is it indeed an angina mimic or not. Uh, I think that's pretty much the uh, thing that I want to talk about mainly. Um, and this is something in, which is done in the US. I don't think we do practice this much in, in Sri Lanka, but there's this heart score. So they believe a lot in, um, trying to help general practitioners, and there is this uh, score that they do to help uh, general practitioners uh, um, as far as a patient is coming with chest pain. Uh, these are the so-called clinical decision rules. So uh, it's a simple tool that they use uh, uh, in general practice, and they give one point for each of these uh, symptoms or signs or whatever you find. So if a patient's sex, for example, is a female above 65 or a male above 55, they give one point. If they have known clinical vascular disease, for example, if the patient who has had uh, um, angiogram before or has had some sort of a heart attack before, you give a uh, point. Uh, he thinks, the patient thinks that uh, there are signs, the symptoms rather, are cardiac in origin, uh, pain is worse on exertion, and pain not reproducible by palpation, and that's very important, isn't it? So, uh, because if it's reproducible pal pal by palpation, that points towards more of a, uh, a musculoskeletal type of chest pain. So you give one point each. So if your patient has um, pretty much zero to two points, they're considered low risk uh, of having angina or any uh, cardiac disease. If it's three points, they're considered intermediate risk, and uh, four to five points, they're at high risk uh, of having some sort of coronary artery disease. So it's a simple tool, I think, uh, not uh, hard to remember, uh, uh, five points. And according to that, we can uh, think whether your patient is having uh, angina or not. So let's try to see if you can incorporate it into the practice. I think it's important that you can do that. And because uh, it's a question that's asked for me many times as well from general practice practitioners. Uh, uh, doctor, what do I do when a patient comes with chest pain and uh, uh, the general, do I have to refer everybody to you, or do, do we, can we, uh, can we uh, refer only certain patients? So I think this, these types of uh, uh, tools may be useful. So once you come up with this tool, and now we have a tool that helps us, uh, the next thing that goes into your mind is, now what? I have uh, found out my patient is at low risk or intermediate risk or at high risk of having coronary heart disease. What do I do next? Uh, so again, so if your patient is at low risk, if you think that it's only zero or one point, you can evaluate your patient uh, themselves for any non-cardiac causes. It's quite common, as I presented in my, uh, of the first two slides. Uh, the commonest causes of chest pain to the general practice is probably non-cardiac. It could be muscular, it could be uh, gastrointestinal. So think about those possible causes, and uh, you don't necessarily need to refer those type of patients to the cardiologist. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, if your patient is at high risk, if you, if you think your patient has four to five uh, points of the, uh, the heart score, that means definitely you need to do something. Uh, take an ECG, you might see some changes, and uh, definitely refer your patient to a cardiologist because they will need further uh, testing, evaluation, etc. Uh, if your patient is in the intermediate category, uh, so that's moderate risk, uh, do an ECG, simple as that, uh, do an ECG, 
uh, and if your patient has changes or even if you are doubtful, uh, you can always refer your patient to a cardiologist for further evaluation. So uh, it kind of makes things simpler, isn't it? So if you uh, uh, determine that your patient is at moderate or high risk, according to that heart score, uh, you can definitely, um, uh, definitely um, uh, refer the patient. If your patient is at low risk, then it's not necessary to refer that patient for uh, a further evaluation. Uh, but more important than any tool that can be discovered anywhere in the world, I think it's very important to use common sense, isn't it? So I think, again, uh, uh, we pay, sometimes we rely heavily on these clinical decision tools. We rely heavily on guidelines, etc. But sometimes we forget that common sense is the most important thing. So if, again, uh, use common sense. If you feel in your gut, and I think that's something that Again, it comes with experience, I think. Uh, a lot of people, uh, once they start treating patients, they have a practice for some time, uh, something in your gut will tell you uh, that this patient's symptoms are not right. It's not uh, something that maybe uh, is it's something that needs further evaluation, needs to be seen by a specialist. In that case, you can refer that patient uh, to a, a cardiologist for further evaluation. And if you think in your experience, again, that this patient's symptoms may not, sim may not be uh, something serious, it may be something uh, non-cardiac, then you can uh, take the uh, initiative and treat them for non-cardiac type of chest pains as well. So uh, I think common sense is the most important tool that you can use in your practice uh, as far as uh, angina or any other symptom is concerned as well. So the next thing that I, I said I will talk about uh, is the mechanism of angina. So again, only one slide, I promise, uh, because I don't want to talk heavily on this. But I think it's important to know about the mechanism of angina, as I said, because uh, if you are treating your patients, we need to know what we are treating. And it's important to tell your patient as well. So essentially, angina is a mismatch between supply and demand. Uh, it, it's as simple as that. And it's the unholy marriage, essentially, of two uh, uh, two, two issues, so one, two elements. So one is um, uh, reduced coronary blood flow, and the other one is increased oxygen consumption. So if the two of them, for example, uh, combine, it's a, a deadly combination. So how does, patient, how, do, how does a patient get a reduced coronary blood flow? Through many things. So vasospasm, it's common. Uh, if there are coronary arteries going to spasm, uh, stenosis, so essentially atherosclerosis, and thrombosis. So three elements that can reduce coronary blood flow, and that can lead to angina. So the supply is uh, limited, and then they get chest pain and angina. On the other hand, if there is increased oxygen consumption, um, so essentially if their heart rate increases or so their workload increases, increased contractility, if the afterload, basically the 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 pressures that they have to, the heart has to contract again. So increased afterload essentially in other terms would be hypertension, isn't it? If your patient is having high blood pressure, uh, or in, on the other hand, aortic stenosis is the other element that can increase your afterload. But commonly, hypertension can lead to increased ox oxygen consumption and angina. And uh, if your preload is increased as well, so if there's more blood coming into your heart, the heart has to work more and hence uh, the oxygen consumption is increased and they will lead to angina. So uh, these are the elements that could lead to angina and if we know these elements, then uh, you can try to figure out what's exactly, what is the reason that this patient is having angina and uh, treat accordingly. And uh, I will talk a little bit more about this during the little talk about our management of patients as well. So the next thing that we'll talk about as far as um, the next steps in patients who you are dealing with as far as angina is concerned is risk stratification and investigation. So again, uh, most likely uh, this is something that's mainly done by the cardiologist, but that doesn't necessarily mean that general practitioners cannot do it as well. Uh, and it's important to know certain things uh, that is available. So the European Society of Cardiology is something that we usually follow as well. There are um, uh, it's two sides of the uh, the, 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 the Atlantic Ocean, actually. So the U.S. do have their own uh, system, and the Europeans have their own system. And you, if we be in Sri Lanka, we have the liberty to choose uh, which uh, models that we like to go by. But uh, generally, the European um, uh, risk stratification model is a bit more 
closer to home, let's say. Um, so when a patient is suspected to be having coronary artery disease and uh, if your patient has come with angina, we, we determine the pre-test probability whether they have art coronary artery disease as well. So again, if you have this simple diagram at your practice, you can go through it and you can tell your patient as well, uh, uh, look here, the, the chances of you having a significant um, uh, heart problem uh, is high, low, etc. So anything less than 5% is considered low risk. Uh, anything uh, between 5 and 10% is considered moderate risk. And anything more than 10% uh, or 12% uh, rather is considered high risk. So uh, you can see the different colors on this uh, chart as well. Um, and so if your patient falls into a low risk category, again, uh, as, uh, um, um, as far as their age and the type of symptom that they are telling you. So typical angina, atypical angina, or non-anginal, according to our definition, which we spoke about earlier, and according to their age, we can risk stratify whether they indeed have uh, an increased risk of coronary artery disease. And the other thing is what we need to do about it. Do we have to evaluate them further, or can we just uh, um, tell them that their chances of having significant coronary artery disease is minimal and hence they do not need any further evaluation. And I think, um, we've, I think the, the, the theme of uh, the general practitioners, your, the college, um, uh, this year you mentioned cost effectiveness, isn't it? So I think if you're talking about cost effectiveness, I think it's very important to know which patients we need to further evaluate and those who do not. Because everything costs money, isn't it? So even doing a simple ECG, doing an echo, uh, an exercise CCG, or the more advanced uh, investigations, everything costs money. So if you want to save money, if you want to be cost effective, it's important to know which patients need investigations and which patients do not need investigations, and those who can just simply reassure and say that they don't need anything further. And that's, uh, that reassurance, I think, is probably the most important thing from a patient's point of view. They sometimes come to you simply for that. Uh, they come to you with simple chest pain, and they say, doctor, is this chest pain from the heart and is it, or is it something more serious? And if you tell them, uh, yeah, according to your symptoms and according to your age, for example, it's very unlikely, uh, and I use that term unlikely, I never say you don't have chest uh, anything uh, because if, you know, nothing in this world is a certainty, uh, but I, I say it's unlikely that you have something significant, and that simple reassurance goes a long way in the, in the treatment of your patient as well, because psychologically and uh, for their own well-being, uh, they're quite satisfied with that, uh, and sometimes they just ask, they just wait for us to uh, give us that, uh, to, for us to give them that uh, uh, go-ahead that there's nothing wrong with them. But if you feel that in your risk stratification that this patient falls into a moderate risk category or a high risk category, uh, in, in that case, obviously, um, uh, investigating them further and evaluating further would be very, very important. And what are the investigations? So again, uh, I'm not going to harp a lot on this because it's something uh, that uh, we as cardiologists will do. Uh, but again, it's important to know uh, if you are referring a patient uh, to a cardiologist, what are the uh, tests they may do uh, on your patient as well. So after risk stratification, if they feel that it's a patient who needs further evaluation, uh, a simple thing as an echocardiogram is done. A resting echocardiogram is uh, recommended. It's uh, as far as Europeans are concerned, class one indication. So everybody gets one um, uh, a resting echocardiogram, and it's important. So you have a look at your heart, uh, the, the 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 LV function, uh, and that's important because. Basically, if your patient who's having stable angina, LV function is good, that's a good prognosis. If your patient who's stable angina uh, is having a low LV systolic function, for example, uh, the prognosis is definitely poorer. And then after that, you use certain other investigations as far as evaluation is concerned. So the, as I mentioned, majority of the time, the, the, the recommendation nowadays is coronary CT angiogram. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail about it because that's not part of my talk today since we are talking about general practice, but uh, in, um, CT angiograms are recommended in patients who have intermediate uh, 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 type of uh, uh, chest pains where uh, the diagnosis may not be very certain. Uh, but again, cost effectiveness wise, CT angiograms, unfortunately in Sri Lanka at the moment, 
Uh, we do not have it uh, um, uh, in most centers, and again, in the government service, where majority of our patients do come to, uh, we do not have that facility, so we rely on other tests. So alternatively, uh, an exercise ECG uh, can be used for your risk stratification. Again, not the most accurate. Again, so again, something that I'd like to just uh, talk briefly about. So this exercise ECG, which we do, uh, let's say your patient who is in the intermediate category gets an exercise ECG and they don't have any changes on it. Uh, the next thing, again, they, the patients feel very happy uh, that the exercise ECG was normal. And they come to us and say, doctor, my exercise ECG is normal. That means I'm clear, isn't it? I don't have any blocks. Uh, and I'm very, very cautious about telling them that, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you are completely clear. The exercise ECG is probably accurate at to about 50%, 60%. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a, a, a clear, uh, clear cut evidence that there is no coronary artery disease, but um, reasonably accurate, let's say. Uh, but I tell them very cautiously, you've done well, no, no changes on the exercise ECG, but, you know, just control whatever you can control, control your blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, uh, and we'll go on from there. It doesn't necessarily mean that there are no blocks. I am very cautious about that. Um, and the other thing is if your patient has high risk uh, in the clinical profile, uh, most of them will require uh, invasive coronary angiogram for further evaluation. Right, so let me, uh, I think this is pretty much what I want to talk about mainly uh, in, uh, in the talk today. I'll speak a few minutes about it. The management principles, I think that's, uh, uh, pretty much what we need to know about our patients, especially in general practice as well. So our management principles would go as far as non-pharmacological management, medical management, interventions and revascularization. I'm not going to talk about a lot because, again, uh, that's more of a specialized topic. And a little talk about the new therapies that your patient may have heard about and they come to you as well and ask, uh, ask you. And that's important, I think, for us to know about what's going on, what are the latest trends, what are the new therapies that are around, because sometimes patients Google, isn't it? Not sometimes, most of the time. Uh, they Google new things, then they come and ask us, and if we don't know about it, it's kind of embarrassing. So we should know uh, ourselves, we should do our research and know ourselves as to what's going on in the world and what are the new therapies available, and especially the new therapies available in Sri Lanka, especially as far as um, angina is concerned as well. So as far as management principles, um, so I think we need to emphasize, especially in the general practice point of view, uh, non-pharmacological interventions. I think it's very, very important uh, because that's what they come to you as well and to know uh, how to uh, manage their, uh, uh, the, the, uh, how, to, uh, uh, how to manage your patient uh, as far as non-pharmacological. I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, and the other thing is some, as far as pharmacology is concerned, there are medicines that will prevent mortality, they will prevent death, and there are tablets that will cause symptom relief. And it's important from patient's point of view, to be honest, they don't care much about tablets that you give to prevent death, the mortality reduction medication. They are more concerned about symptom relief. So I think we need to address that as well. Uh, patients need to be satisfied uh, that you're giving them the correct medications. You need to make sure that they are compliant with their medications. It's very, very important because sometimes they are not. And sometimes, which you probably see yourself, they come to cardiologists and we give them a list of medications which probably run through two pages sometimes. You know, they have 15, 20 medications. Uh, and we, I think it's, it's, it's not exactly the right thing to do. We need to avoid polypharmacy, uh, uh, prescribe the medications that they need and avoid the things that they don't need. And obviously, medications cost money, especially in the private sector. If you are prescribing them a list of medications, uh, 15, 20 medications, it's going to have a definitely economic burden to them. So we need to be cautious and conscious, conscious of the fact that uh, they can have problems, and that may lead to uh, compliance problems as well, isn't it? I think it comes where if you write too many tablets, they will definitely not be taking them because of uh, a monetary factor. And also, again, from your uh, management point of view, know how, when to refer your patient for specialist care. Uh, and the, the trending topic nowadays is individualized approach. So you, you treat your patient in an individual way, uh, and that's pretty much the way to go about it. Um, so lifestyle modification uh, basically is uh, simple things. Tobacco cessation, cigarette smoking, keep their uh, body mass index in or the weight in check, uh, 
ask them to exercise uh, 30 to 60 minutes, seven days a week, that'll be ideal. Uh, keep alcohol at moderation, reduce the salt, uh, have more fruits and vegetables, and keep the saturated fats at a low level. Essentially things that we know about, but it's important in the general practice as well to make sure your patient who comes to you uh, is definitely uh, getting their lifestyle in order. I think it's very, very important. And smoking-wise, it's something that I just talked to them about as well. Uh, if you ask your patient to stop smoking, it's obviously very important. And this is one way of uh, getting them to think about it as well. If you stop smoking, how long does it take for your heart to get back to a normal level? It takes 15 years, yeah? So 15 years. So just because you stop smoking today, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, next day you're will and find that you don't have a risk of getting a heart attack. It takes 15 years for the risk of heart disease to go that to, uh, back to of a non-smoker. So that's very, very important. Um, and then pharmacology-wise, as I mentioned, so the tablets, uh, two categories, the tablets that can cause, uh, can reduce death, three tablets on the left there, aspirin, statins, and ACE inhibitors, again, scientifically proven um, tablets that can definitely uh, be very, very important, apart from lifestyle modification and control of the risk factors, uh, the three drugs uh, important as far as preventing death is concerned. So any patient with angina probably should be on those three medications. And the next line of treatment is for symptoms, and that is pretty much what our patients want. They want to have a good life. They want to have a good quality of life, essentially. So the treatments of symptoms of angina First line medications, you have your beta blockers, your veropamil DLTSM, the dihydropyridines and the nitrates. And the second line uh, medications, your ivabradine, ranalazine, et cetera. So it's a whole long list and um, again, which patient needs what? That's pretty much the question at hand, isn't it? So uh, let me go through a couple of clinical scenarios so that we have a better understanding of what needs to be done. So a simple patient and pretty much the story is the same. 55 year old man, stable angina, worsening symptoms and comes to your practice. Uh, his blood pressure is 140 by 90. His heart rate is 98 beats per minute. Lungs are clear. ECG is normal. He's on aspirin, statin, enalapril, and ISMN. So what could be added to help his symptoms? So if you go through the, uh, the history, he's having angina. Uh, blood pressure is 140 by 90, not too bad. But what about heart rate? 98 beats per minute. So if you go back to our mechanism of angina, if you remember, increased oxygen consumption, one of the reasons for it is if the heart rate is increased, isn't it? So the patient is 98 beats per minute, tachycardic. That's probably why this patient is having worsening angina. So what could we do? Simple as that. Add a beta blocker. He's not on it. If they are intolerant to beta blockers, you could add veropamil or DLTSM. And if they cannot tolerate that as well, or if you have optimized the beta blocker or verapamil diltazem, you can add second line agent, which is ivabradin. So very, very important is, remember, you need to optimize their first line treatment. So if you put them on a beta blocker, make sure they're on the optimal dose. If they have, for example, sometimes you get patients who are on low dose, 2.5 milligrams of bisoprolol, and they're still tachycardic, you can go up on the dose, for example. So don't, in, don't add the second line agents until you have optimized uh, the first line agents as well. Um, a second scenario, let me talk about it. A 55-year-old man diagnosed to have angina again, worsening symptoms to your practice. Uh, the blood pressure is 190 by 100. Heart rate is 62. Lungs are clear, ECG is normal. On aspirin, statin, losartan, ISMN, and bisoprolol. So he's on a beta blocker. Heart rate is 60, so that's fine, isn't it? So what's your problem here? His blood pressure is 190 by 100. So again, the reason that they are having uh, angina, again, according to your mechanism, is probably increased uh, workload, increased afterload because of the high blood pressure. So what can we do? So the answer would be add a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. So multiple varieties available. You could add amlodipine, silinidipine, felodipine, etc. So those are your first line medications and you can try to optimize them to the maximum tolerable levels and control that blood pressure. And what's the desirable blood, blood pressure level we'd like to have in patients with stable angina? Try to keep it down to about 130 by 80. And that's pretty much what we would like uh, for, for you to aim at. So 
the first line agents, you would try to do a, apart from whatever you've already and or patient is on. For example, they're on an ACE inhibitor or, or ARB. Uh, add a non dihydropyrin uh, calcium channel blocker to try to get your blood pressure down to 130 by 80. Last scenario, uh, patient again, similar angina. Blood pressure is 130 by 80, so that's fine. The heart rate is also 62, that's also fine. Uh, ECG is fine. He's on uh, aspirin again, statin, telmisartan, ISMN, and metoprolol, but again, still having symptoms. So what could we do? Uh, the answer then would be something like nicorandil, which is again a potassium channel activator where you can get vasodilatation. And uh, one of the newer medications called ranolazine, which is a, a, a medication that is um, uh, quite commonly used nowadays. It's a new novel medication. Uh, so essentially it works on the other spectrum. So it, what, it's what we call metabolic modulation of uh, angina, where we in reduce the ischemia burden by uh, um, uh, in a, uh, in a m um, microvascular way, uh, where it reduces electrical instability and uh, reduces myocardial dysfunction uh, to the heart. So uh, it's very, very useful in patients who have angina, despite being on your conventional uh, anti ischemic medications. Uh, ranolazine is something that you could add to your patient as well, who's having refractory angina, despite being on those other medications. Uh, just remember that there are certain medications you'd like to avoid uh, as well in stable angina. The combination of aspirin and clopidogrel, again, dual antiplatelets uh, are not really indicated in your patients who have stable angina. It's, uh, it's something that we need to emphasize on. Uh, single antiplatelet, aspirin, yes. If you're allergic to aspirin, clopidogrel, yes, but do not give a combination for patients with stable angina. Avoid beta blockers and non dihydropyridine calcium. So the combination you should avoid. Again, it could lead to severe bradycardia, heart block, etc. And again, avoid the combination of an ACE inhibitor and an ARB. It could cause worsening renal failure. Yeah, so uh, in your practice as well, it's something important. Go through your patient's list to see if your patient is on those medications and avoid those combinations. Um, and just a quick word on in intervention. So do all patients with angina need uh, an intervention? Uh, not really. And basically, interventional procedures are indicated for symptom relief if your patient is having symptoms despite being on optimal medical management. So multiple clinical trials have shown that as well. So we'll first try with medications. If they fail and if they are having symptoms despite that, uh, you can go for interventional procedures such as uh, PCI, CABG, et cetera. Um, last slide, I think, or maybe one before the last. Novel therapy, uh, and that's something that uh, I said it's important for us to understand, know, because these are things that your patient will come to you with uh, as well and ask you questions. Uh, so there are certain patients who are on everything. They're uh, on all the medications that you can think of. Uh, they may have had uh, a bypass surgery as well. For as far as revascularization is concerned. And despite all of this, sometimes there are patients who come to you saying, doctor, I'm still having chest discomfort on exertion. I can't do anything. What can be done about it? So some new therapies, and this is something that is available in Sri Lanka as well. Um, it's expensive, but it's available. Uh, it's called enhanced external counterpulsation. So uh, it's a non-invasive uh, 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 mechanism, basically where they uh, deploy inflation of cuffs uh, wrapped around the calves, thighs, and the buttocks, and they inflate and deflate during the cardiac cycle. So basically, they inflate it during the diastolic uh, part of the cycle and deflate it during the systolic. So as if you remember, again, a little bit of uh, physiology, we remember that coronary blood flow is mainly during the diastolic phase, isn't it? So if you increase or inflate the um, the cuffs during that diastolic phase, the blood flow uh, to the coronaries will increase. Uh, and this is something that has been proved to be quite useful and proven uh, in patients who have so-called refractory angina. So it's available in Sri Lanka. And if your patient uh, has the ability uh, to uh, afford it, unfortunately, at the moment, um, uh, you can refer them uh, for this uh, facility. Uh, so it encounters 34, 35 hours, uh, one to two hours a day, five days of the week for seven weeks. So that's pretty much the 
the prescription that they have. And it's proven to be very useful. I've had a few patients of mine who have had it as well, and they have come up and told me that uh, their symptoms have definitely reduced uh, following um, starting this procedure. So something for you to be aware of. If your patient asks you about it, say that it's available and do some research as to how uh, they can get enrolled into this as well. Um, so pretty much come to the end of uh, uh, the topic, except for the last one, which is follow-up. So ensure that your patient has adequate lifestyle modification advice and make sure they adhere to it. Make sure that they are compliant to their medications. That's very, very important from a general practice point of view. Uh, and you can optimize their medical management. Make sure they are on the optimal doses of whatever medications that you have prescribed. Um, and early referral to a cardiologist, very, very important. So if, for example, if they have refractory angina or angina at rest, very important, refer them to, your, to the cardiologist because they can uh, may, maybe intervene. Uh, and follow-up is important. So within the first year, follow them up for the, uh, every four to six months, and after that, an annual follow-up is uh, satisfactory. Uh, and that will be um, uh, the way to go forward as well. So uh, with that, I end my talk. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm sorry I went over by a couple of minutes, uh, but um, I try to keep on time as much as possible. Um, and have a good rest of the day as well. Thank you, Chamara, for that interesting lecture. Uh, there's one question on the screen. We are, uh, though we are out of time, we have to ask, answer that question. For lifestyle modification, how practical the alcohol moderation? In my experience, I advise alcohol cessation. Your option, your opinion on it? Um, yeah, it's a, a very interesting question, and it's a difficult question to answer, actually. Um, so, what I can tell you is that, scientifically speaking, uh, which is pretty much what we do nowadays, isn't it? Uh, what science has proven is that alcohol cessation is not necessarily needed as far as lifestyle modification, as far as prevention of uh, coronary artery disease is concerned. Uh, there, are, there are multiple research, and there's one very interesting one which was done a few uh, years back where they found that alcohol use has a J-shaped curve, uh, where they have found that compared to patients who uh, have moderate amounts of alcohol, and you compare them to those who haven't had alcohol at all, uh, the, um, the mortality is uh, uh, more in those who haven't had any alcohol. Um, but don't quote me on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's science. So it's a J-shaped curve. So what they say, that's the thing. So moderation is what they've said. So um, uh, if you have high quantities of alcohol, again, you'll die, uh, and those who have, who are drinking moderate amounts, they, they don't die as much. Um, so, uh, but what they don't encourage is don't tell somebody who doesn't drink to have a bit of alcohol. Yeah? Uh, but uh, if your patient is having moderate amounts of social drinking, you don't necessarily have to tell them to stop uh, drinking. If there are excessive amounts, you have to obviously ask them to moderate it. But don't tell a patient who is not having any alcohol to start drinking. Uh, again, my slide, isn't it? Common sense, very important. Um, common sense is important, uh, so use your common sense when you're advising the patients. Uh, you cannot tell a patient who's, having, who's drinking moderate amounts of alcohol it's necessarily bad for them from a heart point of view, but remember a, gastro, a, gastro, um, a gastroenterologist who may be here may uh, disagree with me here because they will say uh, that any patient who has even a tiny amount of alcohol runs the risk of getting uh, liver problems, liver cirrhosis, et cetera, isn't it? The so-called French phenomenon, as we may have heard about as well, um, where in France, where they drink lots of wine, uh, the incidence of heart disease is less, but uh, cirrhosis is on the rise. Uh, so yeah, everything in moderation is my philosophy in life, so I would, <laughs> uh, I would uh, pretty much advise my patients on the same. So moderate amounts of alcohol is not necessarily a bad thing from a heart point of view. I say. Thank you very much, Amara. There's a small token of appreciation to you. <laughs>